Right Where It Belongs by Nine Inch Nails, as chosen by my guest today, Adam Curtis. We were talking about computers. We were talking about why, why isn't it a joyous thing, this thing where all these people collaborated and played virtual, you know, played computer table tennis together and, and, and worked, uh, worked together. Why isn't that a joyous thing? Well, I mean, doing that was joyous, and it's quite obvious from the film I show. It is wonderfully joyous. What's then intriguing is that those experiments or ideas like that were taken up by, I don't know, boosters in, in, from California in the mm. 1990s and used to argue this is the way to organise the world. We, we don't need, with the World Wide Web and with new computer systems in the global economy, we can pull back on having political systems of authority. We can actually let the system manage itself. And you began to get the rise of what I'd, to be a bit pretentious, a managerial ideology. Mm. which simply says, you don't change the world. What you do is you create systems that can stabilise themselves and your job in the node, you're a node in the system, is to do the right thing and somehow the system will stabilise itself, just like in that shed. But there they're playing Pong and it's fantastic and they're all going like that mm. and waving their bats and it's lovely. But when you're a node in a financial network system where your job is to borrow money which is effectively what it is, mm. providing you borrow the right amount of money, the feedback systems will go through the computer models and show that there is no risk and everything is stable. It produces stability for a while, but what I try and show in the first film is that actually it isn't insulated from the forces of power in the world mm. and that there is a naivety at the heart of those of taking things like that experiment of Pong and saying, well, we can organise society or the economy like that. There's a naivety because it doesn't realise that actually outside the shed are big vested interests, big powerful forces and dynamic forces of history, which quite frankly a load of little bats with red and green on either side can't deal with. Mm. And I think that's what I'm trying to argue, that it's an inappropriate use of something that in itself is lovely and joyous. I mean, you know, computers are brilliant at organising things. Fantastic. Well, that's what we were talking about a bit before. I was saying, because I, I genuinely found the, the programme very fascinating and I would definitely recommend that people watch it tomorrow night at nine o'clock on BBC Two. Um, but then I thought to myself, ooh, but... Actually, if I didn't have a computer, I wouldn't be able to put this programme together because it, it consists of me looking at Wikipedia and then looking things up. And you can research things so much quicker, and I, I wouldn't be able to do that at all. Uh, and then also, I, you know, at the beginning of today's show, I asked people to recommend words that rhymed with silver. We got chilva, which is a female lamb. <laughs> uh, but, you know, obviously that's not a world-changing thing, but... It, 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 it is allowing people to communicate, but I suppose one of the points of um, of your programme is that the way that somehow the way that people choose to communicate is a bit weird. There's a bit, there's an amazing uh, thing which I, I missed who said it, but there's a there's a section from this woman who's talking about how she felt that she'd uh, she was like an early adopter of like social networks and stuff, and then she realised that she kind of turned herself into. A, a commodity, a self commodification. Who was it who said that? She was, her yeah. name is, well, was, she's now dead, unfortunately. Mm. She's called Carmen Hermosillo. Mm. Um, her online name was Humdog, and she was one of the early, what we call it, cyber talkers. Mm. I mean, th she, would, she was fascinated by it in the early 1990s. I quote in the film quite a long chunk from her because she wrote this very, very eloquent piece in the mid 90s questioning this, that it would, no, questioning that, that this idea that we are just connected and that that's really all it's about, mm. was that really all it was about? And she, her point is that if you look at the architecture or the emerging architecture of the internet at that point, you could see it as really a beginning of a series of platforms owned, created and owned by large businesses, large corporations, for, on which you are invited to dance and, exp and, and sort of express your individual emotions minute by minute, second by second mm. online, which is wondrous again going back to the game of Pong, it's lovely, it's fantastic we've all done it and it's great but she's also saying pull back look at it, look at it when it's surrounded by that architectural powerful forces, actually and she does it, she, it's very eloquent if slightly pushed, but I think it's good she's saying you are workers 
I mean, what she's really saying is we've misunderstood what our job is these days. Mm. We think it's to actually go to offices and, I don't know, run service industries. Actually, it's one, to shop, and B, to go on the internet and express our emotions because those emotions are then sold on to advertisers in all sorts of other ways and amplified and pushed. She may, it's a very, very artic- more articulate than I can do that actually you, you're, you've got a function there. Mm. And, and, and that really what's happened, she's saying, is that your emotional expressions of your you which you feel is your uniqueness, are being agglomerated by those people who run those, well, what was then called message boards at that time. It's interesting. I mean, it's, it's, it, you're right. It is ambivalent. Mm. These things are wonderful and these things are great fun. But they are essentially organising principles. That's what I'm trying to argue in the, in mm. the series, is that... By coming to see ourselves as parts of systems, parts of networks, it's a managerial idea that we become, if we can all work together, we can stabilise things. Mm. And whilst it is joyous and wonderful and very useful when you're researching on Wikipedia, Mm. it's also not only limiting, not only slightly static, which I think is the really thing I haven't gone into enough in the films, but also when bad things happen, you are quite isolated because what organising principles don't allow for, if they see you just as a part of a network, is alliances and coalitions that have meaning and purpose. They can pull people together in squares in Egypt or to dance on Liverpool Street Station, you know, suddenly. Mm. But that's it. They're organising. They don't tell you of another world. They don't have any vision of what could be an alternative world. They're a sort of manager... When they are used radically, they're a managerial radicalism. Well, this is a thing. I, th- I, I think we touched on it a little bit last time we we spoke. That the thing that the more because a lot of computer things, well, even it's there in the name of the product, isn't it? iPad, iPhone, i iPod. It's it's all about I want to have it the way that I want it. And what you're arguing, which I think is a very interesting point, is that the more that people get into that and say, "Oh yeah, I'm I want everything tailored to me," the more they end up working in a kind of conventional way. And this was touched on again in another one of your uh, blogs. You've got a blog on the BBC website, uh, which was talking about the kind of real people behind the Mad Men programme, the, the, the people that the characters in the, in the TV series were kind of based on. And there was a thing about... V, tell me about, about VW cars. This was an interesting one, because that was kind of playing on the thing of, like, um, you don't want to be like everybody else. You want to be different. Oh, that's he, he's one of my heroes. I can't remember his name, but he's the guy who ran a, an advertising company called Doyle, Dane and Burnback, mm. which the, every now and then is actually mentioned in Mad Men. Um, he's what's he called? Bill Burnback. That's no. right. Bill Burnback is a genius because you, another of the cliches about the sixties is that the hippies were against authority and were reacting against the conformism of products, industry, all those, and, and corporations. In fact, if you look at the history of, of um, um, well, Madison Avenue, but also of the counterculture, very, very, very early on, almost as early as 1967, the advertising agencies, not here, but in America, had worked out that this was brilliant because if you wanted to be different, then you can create lots of different products. And they sold the, the VW Beetle as different. You stand out from the crowd. And actually, I mean, it, as early as 1967, which is really only when the counterculture was getting going, it had already been, I mean, depending on how you look at it, appropriated or developed by people like Bill Burnback. And they really developed this idea of what we would describe as lifestyle consumerism today, where you're not part of a crowd and fitting in, but you are expressing your individuality by buying something. And it's one of the great ironies of our time, which often marketeers point out to you, is that everyone buys an iPad, or sorry, an iPad 2 these days, because they feel that it's expressing their individuality. They feel that. But actually, they're all buying an iPad 2. And they're also paying vastly over the odds for it because somehow they feel it's an expression of individuality. I mean, it's also extremely nicely designed. But you sometimes think, that you've sort of gone full circle when you listen to tech shows talking about iPad 2. Because it's all about how... I mean, I've looked at the archive, and there's a great film from 1958 about car design in America, and it's all about how they're going to promote a new version of a Chevrolet because it's got an, uh, the cigarette lighter is in the steering wheel. 
That's very safe, isn't it? That? No, uh, but it's also it was also presented <laughs> as an amazing step forward for Chevrolet. Right. And sometimes when you look at the tech shows talking about what iPad 2 has that iPad 1 doesn't, you sort of think, we've been here before. And that actually, having started off with Mr. Burnback as being individuals and expressing ourselves through VW Beatles, we've sort of ended up where he came in. It's it, it, a lot of this. We're going to break for a bit more music in, in a short while, but uh, I'd like to to, to uh, yeah keep going on because it seems to me that a lot of the the way that the program works, you, you always use archive in a very interesting way. In this first show, there's a lot of kind of uh, interesting shots of uh, Hillary Clinton, Bill Clinton. It's obvious that they're kind of in a TV studio waiting to do an interview and they'll just you, you get these kind of private moments where you see them as a human being in a way because I suppose they didn't know the camera was on. So they kind of zone out or they start rubbing the nose or something like that. And I think this is a, a, an interesting thing uh, of... That that's it seems to to be correct that because uh, correct isn't the right word but uh, appropriate that's the one uh, because it seems to be what you're talking about a lot in 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 your program is is this thing that of people subscribe to an idea or an ideology it's almost like they don't want to be a person they're, they're embarrassed about being a human and being a kind of a bit uh, uh, you know having foibles and stuff like that they they they, they kind of want to subscribe to some kind of interest in scheme or plan well uh, to go back to your point about in being an individual yet becoming like each other mm. i mean in that first film what i show, what i argue is that the the great dream of the 90s was that somehow we could all be expressive individuals yet the society wouldn't fall apart because we were linked by computers and with the feedback of information between us all somehow like in the game of Pong, there would be a, a system of... Uh, there would be order and stability. Mm. The really interesting thing when you talk to marketeers who work uh, in online stuff is they say that actually all that feedback going backwards and forwards narrows people's assessment of what they could do because it's, it, it's a constant, what's the word, echo or reinforcement of what others are doing. If you like this, then you'll like that. Mm. These people who are like you say this. So actually, what's called the normal distribution, the, the, the curve of, of, of alternatives that are open to you, narrows. Mm. That's, I mean, that's not to say it's a bad thing. That's not to say that actually conformity is a bad thing. It's just that there are, there are slight oddnesses of our time when we believe one thing, that we are all free and expressive individuals. Yet in a funny way, marketers will tell you this, we're becoming more and more and more like each other. We all have iPads. Mm. And we all, I mean, uh, you, you talk to people who study, uh, online marketers who study what people surf on the web. Actually, surfing on the web has rather disappeared these days. People have about 10 sites these days that they regularly return to. Th there is a pattern to human behaviour, which funnily enough, and this is the great irony, computers can spot. Computers don't see us as individuals, they see us a bit like sociologists. They see us as patterns, crowds that have very, very similar behaviour patterns mm. and they can agglomerate us into groups. So really what I'm... I think the, the thing that underlies this series is that there's an ambiguity of our time. We see them as liberating things and in many ways they are joyous, wonderful, fantastic and they do spread information and that is great. N no question about it. But to confuse that with a new kind of world and a new kind of society where power has disappeared is naive. Mm. Well, well, we will. You've made me go all croaky now. <laughs> um, we'll we'll talk about that after this next piece of music, which has got a very beautiful title: "The Dance of the Women in Shabby Coats" from the Shostakovich Ballet. The as it stops there. I don't know. Oh, is that what it's the called ballet the is called? No, it's called the Bolt. The Bolt. It's um, Well, this is just one other piece of music, which, again, I use a lot from The Bolt. Mm. Um, I, I really love Shostakovich's early music. I don't, I don't really get the later symphonies and all that, but mm. in, the, uh, in the 20s and 30s, he just wrote the most beautiful film music and music for ballets. And this is from one called The Bolt, where he literally, I mean, in the ballet, he mixes lyricism and silliness together, which I just love. It's sort of what I try and do with film. Um, this is, it has beautiful titles. There's another track which I thought of bringing in, which is called, it's called The Mimic Dance 
of the office cleaners, brackets, tidying up the department, close yeah. of brackets. I just think that's a great title. Um, I've chosen this because I just think it's just a beautiful piece of lyrical and elegiac music. And it, it's the sort of music you can cut images to. It's beautiful, but it's open enough to allow you to, well, in this case, to have a ballet, but I would use it to cut images to. It's just great. Right, let's listen to it. The women, the dance of the women in shabby coats. <laughs> 